the most expensive stuff in the universe. Oh! Yeah, grandiose. It's called antimatter. Its existence was first theorized in 1930 when the electron was discovered. Scientists thought it might mean the exact opposite should exist too, and they called this hypothetical particle positron. Later, antipods of other elementary particles, protons and neutrons, were proven to exist as well. Morons came later. <laughs> when a particle and its evil twin collide with each other, they disappear, releasing literally tons of energy, 10,000 times more than a nuclear reaction does. But there's a catch. It takes about 100 billion years to create just one gram of antimatter. And it can only be created using the Large Hadron Collider. That's why the cost of this substance is about 62 trillion bucks. And we're not even close to getting that much. Throughout the entire history of space observation, only two objects from another star system, or maybe even another galaxy, have entered our solar system. The first one was the Oumuamua asteroid, discovered in 2017. The second was Borisov a comet found in August 2019. The cloud of dust that surrounds it allows scientists to learn more about substances that may have come to us from another galaxy. An unusual teardrop-shaped star was found. It has almost twice the mass of the Sun and looks like a big drop of lava because of the dwarf star hanging out nearby. The little buddy attracts the energy of its big brother and distorts its surface. Black holes can do that too. There's a star about 215 million light-years away from us that got spaghettified because of the gravity of a black hole nearby. Astronomers on Earth had to use dozens of telescopes to register the event. In the end, they saw a black hole gobbling up a star, which stretched until it became a thin ray of matter. As it was eating, the hole also ejected billions of tons of star material into space. About 250 million light-years away, though, there's a miraculous survival story. In 2020, a red giant came too close to a massive black hole, 400,000 times heavier than the Sun, and got caught in its gravitational pull. Normally, this means there's no escape. Once a black hole catches something, it will never let go of its prey. In this case, the star somehow managed to get away. Most of its outer layers were slurped away by the hungry black beast, leaving behind only the molten core, a white dwarf. And using this loss of mass, it ripped itself from the black hole's tug and started circling it at an ever-increasing orbit. Scientists are sure the white dwarf is still imprisoned forever, though, because the hole continues to chip away at it even as it gets further. In the end, the star will cool down and become a planet that looks much like Jupiter. But that might only happen in about a trillion years. I won't be around then. And much longer than the universe has been around so far. It was proved that a planet can orbit a black hole as it would a star. The energy from the hole would feed such a planet. But to survive in such conditions and not be pumped inside the event horizon, the planet must orbit very quickly at nearly the speed of light, and the black hole itself must spin at the same speed. I can't but imagine what kind of life it would be on such a planet. Um, fast? Earthquakes on the moon, or shall I say earthquakes, aren't something from science fiction. They don't occur as often as on our planet. And when they do, it happens closer to the center of the satellite. Scientists think moon quakes might be caused by the gravity of Earth and the Sun. There are Mars quakes, too. For a long time, the red planet had been considered tectonically inactive. But more recent observations have shown it still has weak quakes from time to time. You probably wouldn't even be able to feel them if you stood on Mars' surface. But it means some geological processes are still going on underneath the red and dusty landscape. At a distance of 640 light-years from the Sun, scientists discovered the planet WASP-76b, where it rains iron. The planet is very close to its Sun and always turn to it with the same side. The term is tidally locked. The temperature on the sunny side is so high that metals melt and evaporate there. The other half of the planet is cool enough that metals condense again and fall down as rain. 
Speaking of tidal locks, our moon is the same way. There's no dark side to our satellite, it's just always turned to us with one side. When the moon happens to be in between the Earth and the sun, what we call its dark side becomes brightly lit. We just can't see it from our planet. (laughs) Figures. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on other planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that it could fill all of our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. But in space, There's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans a thousand times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, it could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there just might be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of a comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of a star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only inhabitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. Until recently, we thought our galaxy looked like a circular spiral. But recent research has shown it looks more like a Pringles chip. Scientists measured the distances between the Sun and other stars and created a three-dimensional map of the Milky Way based on this data. It turned out that our galaxy is slightly curved at the edges and takes an S-shape. At this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. Those in their turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. Fires turned the forest area into a savanna, the atmospheric pressure changed, and our ancestors had to stand on two legs to survive. The biggest explosion since the Big Bang was registered in 2019. This happened in the Aphiochus Cluster, which unites thousands of galaxies. According to scientists, the blast was equal to 20 billion billion, that's 18 zeros, megaton explosions happening once a millisecond for 240 million years. Eh, I'll have to trust that. My math is not that good. Remember the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs on Earth? Who could forget? There might have been another space show that ended badly for at least 75% of all life on our planet in the past. Roughly 360 million years ago, a supernova explosion occurred about 65 light years away from us, and the cosmic rays sent by it swept away the ozone layer of our pretty blue ball. If it had been any closer, all life could have easily been gone. Right now, the greatest threat for us comes in the form of Betelgeuse. Not the movie, but a giant star about 600 light-years away. If it explodes into a supernova, 
we'll see it with unaided eyes even during the day. What would the Earth look like if it was born in another solar system? I did a little research for you to find out, and the results were surprisingly wholesome. There are some warm tropics, strong winds, and giant dragonflies. But okay, let me explain from the very beginning. Since 1995, NASA has discovered more than 4,100 planets outside the solar system. Unfortunately, most of them are either flying ice balls like Neptune or gas giants like Jupiter. But there are still as many as 161 planets similar to our Earth. And one of them is very close to us, in the Alpha Centauri constellation. There are three stars in this constellation. Two of them are called Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you've probably seen them. They're very bright. Because of that, they look like one big star. They rotate around each other very slowly. And there's the third star, chilling around not far from them. It's a teeny tiny red dwarf, Proxima Centauri. It got its name because of its proximity to our Sun. This star is the most interesting one, so let's talk more about it. Proxima Centauri is only 4.5 light years away from us. Oh, and one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Yep. If we went there, it would have taken just a little over 165,000 years of traveling in a space shuttle. Oh, you think that's a lot? For the universe, it's like checking on your fridge. Proxima Centauri is much lighter and much smaller than the Sun. It's also two times colder than the Sun, with a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. That's why we can't see it without a telescope. On the bright side, though, it will burn for trillions of years. And you don't have to worry that one day it will eat us like our Sun. And yes, our twin planet is located right next to Proxima Centauri. This planet is called Proxima b. Yeah, I know, they got creative with all these names. I hope you won't get confused. It's slightly larger and more massive than the Earth. This planet is located in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. It means that there can be water and even some microorganisms there. Yes, it's possible that one day we'll find some life there. But right now, we don't know much about this mysterious planet. It's probably a rocky planet like our Earth and has a similar landscape, but this is just a theory. Who knows what kind of jokes the universe can throw at us? It would be a shame to fly 165,000 years just to stumble upon a giant piece of ice or something. Fortunately, we probably don't have to wait that long. The big brains are now developing a technology that would allow us to move at the speed close to the speed of light. If they succeed, we'll get to Proxima b in just 20 years. But anyway, this video is not just about Proxima b. It's about what would have happened if life had originated not in our solar system, but in Alpha Centauri. What if we were orbiting Proxima Centauri, or the other two stars? So now, let's imagine that the Earth has replaced Proxima b. I'm going to call this new planet, New Earth. Guess I'm not very creative at naming either. First of all, the orbit. The new Earth must be about 25 times closer to its star than Proxima b is. Otherwise, it would be unimaginably cold. Let's move the planet a little closer. Excellent. The day still lasts 24 hours, but our orbital period is very high. Proxima b revolves around its star in 11 days. But we'll make it in just 8. Hey, a birthday party every week? Sign me up! Oh, hold on, there's another problem. You see, Proxima Centauri is a flare star. This means that sometimes, just out of nowhere, it throws out some stellar winds. These winds carry around a bunch of ionized particles, which then settle on the planets. Yeah, our Sun also does that, but Proxima Centauri tries to finish us off 2,000 times harder than our Sun. So the radiation levels are off the scale, to say the least. Don't worry, it's fine. All we need are incredibly strong magnetic fields. They will help us create a very thick atmosphere that can protect us from the Proxima Centauri's tantrums. So now it's going to be very warm. Or not. Another problem. 
scientists are still not sure how exactly Proxima Centauri's planets rotate around it. What if they turn out to be tidally locked, like our moon? Then one half of the new Earth will be a frying pan, and the other half will be some frosty deserts. Oh, it's fine, we'll just settle down somewhere in the middle. Didn't expect that I would ever say this, but it will definitely be warm at the North Pole. And if we're lucky with the rotation, we'll just get a cozy, warm planet. The average temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and there aren't any extreme temperatures. On the new Earth, we have much more water. The weather is generally pretty crazy, some very strong winds and quite destructive rains that can go on for quite a long time, but you can adapt. Temperature changes are much more noticeable in the mountains. Just like on Earth, the higher you climb, the colder it gets, except it's very cold right here at the top. Because of this, the mountains and hills have jungles below and snow-covered deserts on the tops. But in general, it's almost like the Earth's tropics. The flora is very rich, the trees are very low but lush. The thick atmosphere also makes flying easier, so there are a lot of large flying animals. Like dragonflies with a wingspan of 16 feet. Uh-huh, moving on. The sky here is much lighter than that on Earth and very cloudy. Sometimes it may seem completely white. But the starry night is beautiful and bright. There are four suns. Our main one is Proxima Centauri. We can also see two bright Alpha Centauri stars. And finally, our old sun, which looks like a bright, distant star. I'll allow you to shed a tear for the old Earth. There's a few planets near us, like Proxima Centauri C. The host star is surrounded by two belts of cosmic dust, so get ready for some gorgeous, colorful night views. So what we have in the end is a little crazy, but a beautiful green planet. I personally wouldn't mind moving there already. What about you? Write in the comments. Alright, so now we know what would have happened if our Earth had been born near Proxima Centauri. What about the other two stars? Unfortunately, we won't be able to rotate near two stars at the same time. Scientists suspect that Alpha Centauri A and B have some kind of common planet that jumps from one orbit to another, but it's probably very cold. Let's choose Alpha Centauri A. Just like on the new Earth, here our average temperatures are about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but now the temperature variation is quite large. It goes from negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit at the South Pole to 113 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator. Eh, we'll be fine close to the north. The day is still 24 hours, and the orbital period is one year and one month. It's almost the same for the Alpha Centauri B, but the orbital period is about half a year. Other conditions are very similar to those on Earth. Changes in the seasons are almost not noticeable. The temperatures don't change much either. No matter where we settle down, the neighboring star will be clearly visible, but we probably won't see Proxima Centauri. And that's about it. Of course, all this assumes perfect conditions. Just like on Earth, one slightest change, whether it's a thin atmosphere or a bigger distance from the star, and it won't end well. We got really lucky with our Earth. But even so, the chances of finding a habitable planet are very high. Even with the tiniest possibility, there will be about 15 million planets in our universe that we can find life on. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century. But modern studies of Eta Carinae estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. 
Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carinae releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carinae is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carinae is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carinae experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carinae was the second brightest visible star after Sirius, the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare ups, Eta Carinae has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now, astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carinae, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carinae is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carinae is really two stars. Eta Carinae A and Eta Carinae, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carinae C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carinae is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carinae in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carinae's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carinae because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Place where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table. And when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close. 
or more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before, many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in a star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000-plus light-years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernova, and now it finally occurred in real life. Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door.